they're good to go. You just need to power them on.
don't think you need a microphone. We just welcome you. Welcome, everyone. What a great group as we uh, gather together in uh, the last uh, event in our presidential speakers here at, uh, here at Alma College. I'm Jeff Abernathy, president of Alma College. Delighted to welcome you all. This series of ours, this presidential speaker series, is aimed at democracy, helping us all to think about the obligations of democracy, helping us to, uh, to think about uh, the hard problems that are facing our society, societies around the globe, uh, and to hear from speakers right, left, and center uh, as we make our own opinions. This, as a liberal arts college, is our obligation to be that marketplace of ideas, to help students uh, form their own opinions, to challenge them, uh, and when they come to graduate, be prepared uh, to speak out in the public forum as citizens. Welcome today. We're delighted to have you. Honored to have uh, Justice Richard Bernstein uh, and to introduce Justice Bernstein, our uh, senior pastor and director of the Center for College and Community Engagement, Dr. Andrew Conway. Thank you, Jeff. I always appreciate getting applause. That's a great way to start. Uh, I'm going to tell a quick story to get us going and then uh, welcome uh, my friend and really honored guest here today, Justice Richard Bernstein. We live in a wonderful state. We know that and we celebrate that Alma is in the center of all of it. We are truly the heartbeat of Mid Michigan. I'm going to take that one off. I think it's buzzing a little on me. We celebrate that we are here in mid-Michigan and we have the opportunity to truly know our neighbors and build community. I happened to be at dinner uh, last fall with my daughter who is here, Denali. Denali is a 15-year-old, she's a sophomore. And Denali and I and her mother are having dinner and at dinner, we're outside at this particular restaurant, there is a celebration for a birthday. And someone says, Sing happy birthday for Richard to all of us who happen to be out there. And I looked and said, my goodness, that Supreme Court Justice, Richard Bernstein. <laughs> so I looked at my daughter and said, you better sing loudly. <laughs> and we sang, but I'm going to use this as an example as a, a, to get into Justice Bernstein's um, incredible sense of hospitality, his leadership, truly his joyful personality, in addition to his many accolades on the bench and, and prior in his time as a litigator and an attorney. My daughter, who's interested in the law potentially, says, oh, that's, that's kind of interesting. I'm like, interesting? That is a sitting Supreme Court justice. Please go over and introduce yourself with me. And I think, maybe a picture if we get lucky. Walk over, and not only did Justice Bernstein say hello to my daughter, but immediately ignores all of his guests for his birthday to speak to the 15-year-old. <laughs> Amazing! I am near tears as the father there, but I say, thank you, thank you, thank you. You don't know what you just did. To which Justice Bernstein continues to talk and says, you have some great energy. What's your deal? <laughs> Tickled to have the pleasure, truly one of the great honors of my life to be able to talk to a man that I have admired for many years, that I have talked about, that I have championed, and that really I am just delighted to have had the chance to have a conversation with and said, I'm at Alma College. And talking about our wonderful institution said, you know, Justice Bernstein, if it would ever be possible, without me saying it, he immediately jumps in and says, yes, let's make that happen whenever we can. And we've been trying to make this event happen now for a few months. And thanks to COVID, uh, we have delayed a couple of times, but we are here and you are all here. Justice Richard Bernstein is a champion in the state of Michigan champion nationally and internationally for uh, the rights of those with disabilities and those without. He is a person that I think all of us, regardless of our political persuasion, can look at and say, yes, this is leadership in action, and this is a demonstration of community and what we are trying to form. It is my deep and great honor, then, to invite up here today to Alma College, Justice Richard Bernstein. May God bless each and every one of you who is here today. May he guide you. May he show you mercy and kindness. May he always allow for you to find your way home. We simply need to believe that extraordinary things are possible. We simply need to believe that extraordinary things can 
will and must happen for each and every one of us. But let us pose a question. The question that we all seek answer to. The question that drives us. Why is it that if God is so good, if he is so merciful and kind and just, that he allows for bad things to happen to otherwise such fine people? And why is it that there are some who walk among us who come to know a greater struggle, a greater hardship, a greater challenge in life than others can possibly imagine or even attempt to comprehend? And why is it as an author once penned, that the streets of heaven are too crowded with angels today. People ask, what qualities go into being a Supreme Court justice? And so often people will say, oh, it's all about your academics, your intellectualism. Your ability to research and to write and to publish, those must be the qualities that truly matter. When making decisions that affect people's entire lives, their freedom, their independence, their overall quality of life, academics, or what school you went to, your ability to research and write and to publish, none of those things are of consequence. The one thing that matters is life experience. See, I have come to believe that the Creator gives us our experiences for a reason, for a purpose. An easy life does not always correspond to a good one. And often those who walk among us, who come to know what it means to truly struggle, to really face hardship, to deal with real difficulties, I have come to realize that those are the chosen ones. Because it is only through struggle that you can come to understand and appreciate why it was that you were created why you were sent here, and what your ultimate mission in life truly is. See, it's through our life experiences that dreams get replaced by wisdom, but that we're able to use those experiences to have an impact, to have change, and to make a difference in the lives of those who exist around us. We don't always have to be happy. We don't always have to be joyous. People always say, oh, what is it that will bring you happiness? How is it that you're going to find that sense of happiness? Life isn't about being happy. It's about finding mission. It's about understanding and appreciating purpose. It's about realizing just why it is that you were created. I've come to find in life that we don't always have to be happy with the Creator. We don't always have to praise Him. What you come to realize is that when you find that it's okay to be sad. When you find that it's okay to be frustrated, when you find that it's okay to be angry, when you find that it's okay to have these real emotions, these genuine emotions, you will come to connect with the Creator in a true, genuine, lasting, and profound way. Because that is the core and the basis of a real relationship, of a genuine relationship. 
a relationship that will get you through the difficulties, the hardships, and the struggles of life. No, we don't always have to be happy. And we don't always have to smile. But if we're able to have that real connection, that true connection with our Creator, we get to have a life of wonder, a life of fulfillment, a life of purpose, a life that really matters, one of excitement, joy, anticipation, and ultimately gratitude. So why is it that bad things happen to otherwise such good people? And why is it that there are some who come to know a greater struggle or greater hardship than others? And why is it that the streets of heaven are too crowded with angels tonight? There are so many of us, as we look at the years gone by, who have faced immense loss, who have come to know real difficulty, and true and lasting sadness. And so often as we face these challenges in life, as we come to face a real pain, people so often say to us, as we're going through a life transition, they'll often say, oh, I know this is difficult, but I am sure that you're going to make a full recovery. When they say to us, when we're going through an immense sense of loss, they will say to us, oh, I am sure that you're going to ultimately find closure. There's so many people. We are not going to have an opportunity to recover. And closure is something that will never happen. But the key isn't always focusing on recovery, but finding a way to adapt. Adapting to a life that you might not want, but to a life that has ultimately been chosen for you. The power comes in finding that ability to adapt to new circumstances, to new situations. And through that adaptation, you will come to realize the power that comes with knowing that sense of mission. Through adaption, you come to find that you will be able to achieve and accomplish and experience things that you never imagined, never envisioned, and never thought could ever happen. So why is it that bad things happen to otherwise such good people? And why is it that there are some who come to know a greater struggle or greater hardship than others? We come to realize as we go through life that things can change in an instant, without notice and without warning. Now I've been blessed in my life. I've had the opportunity of completing 25 marathons. I've had the opportunity of completing a full Ironman competition. For those of you who are unfamiliar, an Ironman is a 2.4 mile swim, followed by a 112 mile bike to be completed by a 26.2 mile run. Hmm. Now the rules of the competition are quite simple. If you stop, if you rest, if you take a break, you run the risk of missing a cutoff. If a cutoff is missed, you will be immediately disqualified from the competition. If you finish at 12.05 instead of 12 o'clock, it is like you were never even there. <laughs> Two years of effort, work, and training will literally be for nothing. So I invite you to picture, if you would, the feeling you would have as you dive into a frigid body of water. Now the water temperature that morning of Lake Coeur d'Alene was 55 degrees. 
I invite you to picture what it feels like to swim in total darkness. You don't have any idea where you started. You don't have any idea where you're going. And you don't have any idea where you are. Being the only disabled competitor, you repeatedly get kicked in the face by all the other swimmers. Being blind, you can't brace for the ensuing impact. You try to surface, but there are other swimmers immediately above you. Lastly, other competitors become entangled and ensnared in the rope that connects you to your guide. And as they become tangled, the rope becomes constricted. And as the rope constricts, it starts taking you below the surface. The harder you swim, the harder you attempt to break free, the faster you get taken below. You start to feel a drowning sensation as you try to get oxygen. Now, it's easy to have a relationship with God when life is good. It's easy to have a relationship with the Creator when you're in good health, when your family is thriving, when your business is doing well. But I've come to realize through my experiences that the nature and the essence of a real relationship is what happens when you're scared. What happens when you're in pain? What happens when the outcome is uncertain? And in moments like that, that ability to have a real sense of faith is so critical to your basic survival. Because what happens in moments like that is you realize that often that the body is simply mortal. The body is only flesh. But it is the spirit and it is the soul that have given the opportunity to disconnect from the flesh can truly soar, can pierce the heavens and do nothing less than touch the face of God. So why is it that bad things happen to otherwise such good people? Why is it that there are some who come to know a greater struggle or greater hardship than others? And why is it, as a writer once penned, that the streets of heaven are simply too crowded with angels? We all know, as we go through life, and especially for the students that are here, you are going to face it if you haven't already. But life can change, and it will change in an instant. It will change without notice. And it can change for the good, and it can change for the bad. It was a beautiful day. And I was in New York Central Park. <laughs> I had just finished my 17th marathon. I was walking in the pedestrian lane where I had memorized the circumference that serves as a loop around the park. I can do it without a guide. I can do it without an escort. And as I walked in the pedestrian lane, on a beautiful morning in August, 85 degrees and sunny, a bicyclist was traveling at a speed of in excess of 35 miles an hour. When he hit the park's biggest hill, he was unable to maintain control, and in doing so, veered into the pedestrian lane where I was walking, where he struck me directly in the back. Now, a 35-mile-an-hour impact is catastrophic to say the absolute least. This required over 10 weeks of hospitalization at New York's Mount Sinai Hospital. Life is never about the big things. It is always about the little. We so often get focused on all these big things. But it's the little things that really matter. It is the little things that God gives us, that go to life at its essence, that go to life at nothing less than its ultimate core. 
In my situation, I would miss what it was like to have the opportunity to use the bathroom. I would miss how it felt to feel the hot water of a shower, to sleep the night without having to ride at an indescribable level of pain. People used to come and visit, and I always ask them, so tell me, when you leave Mount Sinai, where is it that you are going to go? They'd always say in a very rudimentary, mundane way that they were going to head back to the office. They were going to go meet some friends for dinner. I always tell them, these are the things that so many of us dream about. Feeling of feeling fresh air, being outside, going to a restaurant, going into an office. These are the things that people pray for. These are the things that people dream about. I ask every student and every community member that's here today to honor me by doing this. I would ask of you that you celebrate every victory, that you celebrate every accomplishment in your life, no matter how small or incidental you might think it is, I would ask that you find an opportunity to take joy and pride of every accomplishment that you have. No matter how small, no matter how incidental you might think it is, I would ask that you take unbelievable gratitude in what you've accomplished and what you've achieved. In my situation, I have been a 17-time marathoner. I was an Ironman. But there were days where just simply moving your leg <laughs> took more effort and energy than all of those things. But you would find that opportunity to find an opportunity to celebrate that, to find joy in that, to find meaning in that. And ultimately, with a lot of effort and a lot of work, I was able to start moving my legs with the help of a walker and lots of people who were able to move down the hallway and make it to the nurse's station at the end of the ward. Now, after getting released from the hospital, it was time for the New York City Marathon. This would be my 18th marathon, but it would be my first after a catastrophic injury. And as we ran the streets of New York, we crossed the 59th Street Bridge, began running up First Avenue, the pain was becoming so severe, it was becoming so intense, and I remember reaching up to the heavens praying to the Creator and saying, God, please just let me have this. Let me have this. This will give me the ability to move forward. This will give me the chance to turn a page. But simply, please, let me have this. And right there on First Avenue at mile 18, I had the experience that I believe all of us have, or all of us will have. I had my battle with the Creator. The pain was so intense that I remember just feeling it with every aspect of your body. The rage and the anger that I had for what had happened, for what had occurred, for the challenges and the difficulties that we had to face every day. All that rage and all that anger was all pent up and it was all there. And you could feel the raging battle. You could feel the wind. You could sense the lightning. You could hear the power of the thunder for that raging storm that existed. And then, I was able to find what I had always been looking for. What I believe all of us have been looking for. I 
was finally able to make peace with my new body, with my new circumstance, with my new life. But I was finally able, finally able, to make my peace with God. Why is it that bad things happen to otherwise such good people? Why is it that there are some who come to know a greater struggle or greater hardship than others? Why is it that the streets of heaven are too crowded with angels? I believe the answer goes something like this. At a certain point in life, you can't spend your time and your energy and your effort focusing on how you're going to get over it. For you simply have no other alternative than to just get on with it. For ultimately, it is always those who will do what is hard that can achieve nothing less than what is truly great. For we must see our lives as though we are part of a great biblical story. There will always be chapters. <coughs> there will be chapters of pain. There will be chapters of setback. There will be chapters of heartache. But it's only through those chapters you will come to find hope. You will come to experience joy. You will come to feel a sense of triumph. For it was deep into the night as the angel came upon Jacob. And there existed an immense battle that, as we know, raged until the dawn. And when the sun rose, the angel blessed Jacob. But as we know from scripture, gave him a new name, the name of Israel, which is translated to mean one who struggles with God. But as we know from the teachings, Jacob was not left uninjured. He was given a shattered hip. He would walk with a limp, and he would know great pain for the remainder of his days. I believe that scripture tells us this. For it was only through Jacob's struggle, it was only through his pain, it was only through his anguish that he was able to connect. He was able to understand. He was able to empathize. It's only through these qualities that he was able to become a leader ultimately the father of a nation. Look to your own lives. As I look to my own, I think that if I hadn't been blessed with these struggles, with these setbacks, with these challenges, with this level of pain, I don't think I would be a very good judge. I wouldn't be very kind. I wouldn't be very patient. I wouldn't be as wise or as understanding. And I wouldn't be as merciful. We have to celebrate the experiences that God has chosen for each and every one of us. We certainly don't have to like it. But we have to find some degree of mission some degree of purpose. Why else would the Creator give us struggle? Why else would He give us loss? Why else would He give us difficulty? But for us to use it to make life better for others, to have an impact, and to do nothing less than make the world a better place. Let us celebrate who we are. Let us celebrate the journey that has been chosen for us. 
Let us celebrate the Creator. Let us celebrate the idea that yes, for so many of us, we are mortal. And for so many of us, we are infirmed. And for so many of us, we know hardship and struggle. But it is our spirits, and it is our souls, that truly know no limits. So thank you for letting me give the formal presentation. And now, what I'd love to do is let's make this as conversation. I just, what I love about being in a religious school is that you're able to kind of really kind of allow for your spirit to speak. It's, it's such a wonderful opportunity to be here because, you know, so often you don't get an opportunity to really have a chance to express who you are the way that I get to with you guys at this wonderful school. So what I'd like to do is really open it up and I want you guys to ask, and I will stay here as long as you guys keep interested. Um, and I would love for you to ask any and all questions that you could possibly think of. And of course, we can get into the workings of the court. We can talk about kind of the more technical things, which is what is it like to be blind and to be serving on the Supreme Court? How is it that a blind person actually performs their duties? You know, how do you understand a crime scene? How do you appreciate evidence? How do you keep up with the workload? How does this all work? Delighted to get into that. And of course, if you have some questions about anything that you want to talk about, there is no question that's inappropriate. There's no question that's out of bounds. There is no question that I would not love to have the opportunity to answer. Anything and everything, I would be delighted to talk with you about. Just the first thing, I'm going to walk around with the mic just so folks can make sure that they're loud enough to get in there. But uh, students in particular, yeah, open floor. So any questions anything. you have. Make us proud. Kate, you can go first. Introduce yourself as well, if you don't mind for it. Hi, Kate Simons. We met earlier. Yes. She's our, let's give her a round of applause. She's our AmeriCorps. <laughs> Um, my question is, is uh, what was going to law school like as a fine, fine person and how did you overcome those challenges? Okay, so it's a beautiful question. So you know what, law school was, and I'm just going to always be direct, law school was excruciatingly difficult. <laughs> it was excruciatingly difficult. And I have to tell you, like, I, you know, one of the things, and I'll, I'll get to, to law school in a second, but well, and maybe if, if you guys have a high school or a place I could go to, I would love to go and have a chance to, to spend time there. Because I have to tell you, what was more difficult than law school was high school. High school <laughs> was so difficult. And I'm just going to tell you, it was incredibly challenging. I was the only person with a disability probably in my whole district. So as a result, like, it was very hard to fit in. Right? I, I just couldn't find my place, and it was just, just a challenging time. And for anyone that has kids, or anyone that might be watching us tonight who's in high school, I want to share with you something really important. A lot of people are going to tell you, well, you know, do your best to fit in. Do your best to, you know, make friends. Do your best to, you know, do all these types of things. And they're going to put the onus on you to try to kind of, you know, fit in as much as you can. I wish that someone would have told me this when I was going through it. Because in life, what you have to realize is in certain situations, it gets better. Things really get better. And so if you're in a high school right now and you're really like you were like me, where every morning you woke up, it was such a difficult struggle. You didn't want to go. It was just something you just didn't want to do. You didn't want to be a part of it. Every day was just this immense battle to have to get up and have to go to school because you just didn't enjoy it. This is the deal. Life is all about phases. There are just different phases that we go through. And in certain situations, you know, just as I can say from my high school experience, it just wasn't my time, right? For some people, high school is their time. And it's going to be the greatest time they're ever going to have. And may God bless them for that. But for other people, it's just not your time. So the advice that I would give to any parent that's facing these kind of challenges right now is just tell your child, and if it's a person that's watching this right now that's in this situation, just know that, OK, this might not be your time. But your time is coming. 
It is always the people that struggle in high school who live the most extraordinary lives. It is always the people that have to face the biggest challenges or hardships or difficulties because they're different, who God has chosen to go out there through their experiences and do extraordinary things. So just understand that the experiences that you're now gathering while you're going through your high school years are being given to you so that you can then use them, as we were talking about prior, to have a real impact and a real effect and countless numbers of people all across the world. And if you can just find a few good friends, you don't have to be the most popular, you don't have to be cool, just find a few nice friends that will allow for you to feel a sense of belonging, then you're doing fine. And just know it only gets better. Now in law school for me, it was similar to this because, you know, I'm, I'm always very honest about it, right? I went to Northwestern, and, and <coughs> if it takes you an hour to do something, it takes me five hours to do the same thing, right? So everything is a one to five ratio. So for a blind person, that one hour it takes you, multiply it by five, and that's what I have to do. And I remember when I was in school, you know, I was envious of all my friends who, it just came easy for them, right? The grades came easy, the jobs came easy. Everything kind of came easy to them. And then there was like myself and, and the group that I was in in law school. And I always like to tell people, well, you know, you know, I'll let you guys know a little secret. I always love having fun with this. I always like to tell people, you know, I graduated in the 10th percentile. But what I leave out is it was the bottom. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the thing that you just don't, it's, I don't overshare. I'm just <laughs> not <laughs> requires to find out which percentile. <laughs> and I can tell you, since we're all friends and we kind of have a certain viewpoint to life, it was the bottom 10th percentile. <laughs> but you know what they call the person that, well, I, you know what, I'll tell you what, you know what they call the person who graduates even last in their class from Northwestern? You know what they call someone who graduates last? You know what they call them? A lawyer. <laughs> That's what they call them. So for all of you that are here at Alma who are like me, where like you just you work unbelievably hard, and it just doesn't come to you, right? You just you just work and you work and you work, and the more you work, you're like I just can't get ahead. Like no matter what I do, I cannot get ahead. Well, you're just like me, right? I worked harder than everybody else, and I still came in last. No matter what I did, I was still last. That was just the way it was. But here's the thing. When I graduated from law school and I passed the bar, I had an appreciation for it that you can't believe. And a lot of my friends today, they're working in big law firms, they've achieved what they want to achieve. They're partners in these like, mega law firms, and they're doing what they want to do, but they're not fulfilled. Whereas the people that I was close with in law school, who all graduated bottom, are off doing unique things. They're off doing exciting things. We couldn't get the jobs that everybody else got. It didn't come to us. So people had to make their own path. And now what happens is all of those people who had to make their own way in life, for all intents and purposes, they feel a sense of excitement and enthusiasm for the opportunities that were given to them and for the life they ultimately get to live. And the reason is it didn't come easy. And as a result, because it was so sought after and it took so much to get to it, that appreciation is at just an entirely different level. And I'll just share with you very quickly, when I was in law school, so I was right out of Lake Michigan, and February in Chicago was, I mean, well, it's like February here at all. But it's, it's, <laughs> I have to say one funny story. I remember when I, was, I was part of like the admitted students. There was like, there was this group they asked people to be in to kind of greet like admitted students to kind of help sell them on Northwestern. And they were like, hey, you know, would you kind of help with admitted students weekend and, you know, try to pitch the school, get people excited. And I always remember they said, I always remember this, they said, listen, people are going to ask you about the weather in Chicago. 
And, you know, if you could try not to emphasize <laughs> So I remember the day that I said, okay, so someone actually asked me this question. They said, so what is, like, the winter like in Chicago? And I said, well, you know, I find the winter in Chicago to be quite balmy. <laughs> That's my understanding of it. That's always been my appreciation of the Chicago winter. But here's the thing. I just remember there was this one February night. And I'm sharing this story for the students because I just know that there's some people out there that have similar experiences that I did. It was a cold February night, and I just remember the wind was just howling off Lake Michigan. And when the wind would come off Lake Michigan, I mean, the whole building, you could just, it was, it was just intense. And I just said to myself, I said, God, I said, look, this isn't going very well. I said, this is just not going well. And I just got my first semester grades, and they were pretty bad. And I just said, I said, Hashem, I said, in Judaism we say Hashem, it's so, sometimes I just will say that in lieu of God or Creator. But I said, Hashem, I said, if you could just, I just said, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make you a deal. I'm going to promise you this. If you allow for me to graduate from law school, and if you give me the chance to pass the bar, I'm going to make you a promise. I will dedicate my entire professional career to representing people with disabilities and special needs who otherwise can't get representation. But Shem, this is, this is, I'm praying to you because I can't do that unless you allow for me the opportunity to graduate. I can't do that unless you allow for me the opportunity to pass the bar. So miraculously, I graduated from Northwestern, and I have to say, even more miraculous, I passed the bar. And I remember going back to my family's law firm, and I remember saying to them, look, a promise is a promise. I made this promise to Hashem that if I was able to graduate from law school and pass the bar, that I would dedicate my professional career to representing people with disabilities and special needs. I mean, look, a promise is a promise. If you make a promise, you have to adhere to it. That was the promise that I could make. And there were a number of signs that came along the way where basically I knew that I was going to be held to that promise. And so I remember saying to my brother, my sister, and my dad, we're going to start a public services division. And this is going to be your favorite part. We are not going to charge the representation <laughs> of people with disabilities who otherwise are not going to have access to it. We just aren't going to charge. We're not going to fee shift. We're not going to take any money. We're going to do these cases because we can then represent folks who won't have anywhere else to go. And as long as we're taking these cases, they will get our representation, whereas most cases don't get taken because it's too expensive for the firm to take them on. You know, the, the cases I got involved with, nobody would take these cases. Nobody. They were insane to take these cases. I mean, basically, you would lose hundreds of thousands of dollars, you put in years of work, and the reason you were doing it was because you wanted to make life better for people with disabilities, especially veterans. But in terms of a business model for that, there isn't one. It's basic insanity. My dad was always kind of funny about this. He would always tell people, he'd go, yes, Richard, Richard has come back, and he made this promise, so now we've established our public services division, and we're doing, and his division is exclusively pro bono. And then my dad would say, it's our fastest growing department. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing is, is, is that here's the thing. The reason I share this with you is because I really believe if you do things because it's the right thing to do, if you genuinely believe in what it is that you're doing and you genuinely believe why you're doing it, things will usually work out. They don't come easy. There's going to be a lot of sleepless nights. But there's going to be circumstances or situations or events that are just going to happen. And it's going to guide you in ways that you didn't think would ever occur. 
and it's going to be completely unexpected, and it's going to be totally unforeseen, but it's going to come right when you need it, and it's going to come in just the right way, and it's going to give you exactly what you need. It's not going to give you more, but it's not going to give you less. But I mean, literally, in the cases that I would get involved with, they were just certain miracles that would happen in every aspect of it. And what's wonderful about it is you can actually see the impact it's had on people. I remember my first case, we were fighting with the city of Detroit to allow for people, mainly veteran, to use the bus who couldn't access the bus because the lifts didn't work and the drivers weren't trained. And so by representing them, we were able to transform the Detroit Department of Transportation to allow for all fixed route systems to have accessible transit and to allow for people who needed that transit to be able to go places and do things. And that became the model for, for cities all across the country. We took on a case about aviation that allowed people with disabilities to have greater access to US aviation, which then basically affected aviation and airport construction all throughout the US. So you never know what kind of effect you're gonna have. I used to be a professor at the University of Michigan, but don't teach there anymore because I sued them because <laughs> it wasn't really great for my career, but it was one of those situations where they weren't allowing veterans access. They basically, the big house was, they just wouldn't, they wouldn't make it accessible for people to access it. And you had all these United States veterans, all these incredible people who were coming out of ROTC who wanted to go to a football game but due to their injuries to disservice to the country, they couldn't access the stadium. And so, you know, we worked on that for probably five to seven years to make the stadium fully accessible and compliant so that all people can use and enjoy the stadium. And that set forth guidelines that are now used in all commercial construction all across the country. The reason I'm sharing these stories with, with you, especially for the students, you have no idea who you're gonna meet, you have no idea who's gonna approach you. You have no idea what's gonna happen. But just keep your eyes and your ears open because it's gonna create an opportunity for you to do something that could have, as we all call the butterfly effect, that could have impacts and effects on people in an incredibly transformative way. Okay, next question, I get very passionate. Who's got a next question? We can definitely get one or two more in oh, here. Okay. Okay. Right. We'll, we'll have a couple folks who are stepping out there. But, uh... um, my name is Dee, and my question is, yes, do, you have, here. Oh, uh, yeah. um, <laughs> do you have any advice for disabled people fighting with like inaccessibility? OK. So first off, what I'm going to do, and this is something I, I really would it, it, it throw out, I give my telephone number to everybody. Because, and it's my personal stuff. So you, you're not going to get a clerk. You're not going to have to go through a switchboard. And you can all take it down and give it to anybody you want. Because I really feel strongly about this, especially as a judge. You need to be accessible to people. People need to be able to reach you. They need to be able to call you. And what I've always found is, is, is that the only way you're going to know what's going on is if people are able to communicate with you. So this is my personal cell number, and you can please write it down, please feel free to use it for whatever you need. If you call, I will do my absolute best to get back with you within 24 hours, but please be merciful because sometimes <laughs> with everything going on, it might take two or three days, but I will call you back. My phone number is 248-866-2959. It's 248-866-2959. 59. The advice that I would give to you if anyone that has a disability is first off to feel free to call me because if there's some specific issues that we need to talk about, we'll do that offline. Um, but most importantly, I think the real key to it <coughs> is just to realize, and, and I know it's like the, the, it sounds like a broken record, but just realize that you are created for a very specific reason. I really believe, and I believe this wholeheartedly, that you're chosen because of your struggle. And the thing I'm going to ask you to do is, yes, you're going to have to work harder than everybody else. Yes, it's going to be more difficult for you than everybody else. Yes, it's going to be more challenging for you than for anybody else. But when you get to the end of your days, if you live up to the responsibilities that God has chosen for you, 
you're going to have an extraordinary life. You're going to meet remarkable people. You're going to travel to the most exciting places. It's not going to be easy, but it's going to be miraculous. OK, next question. We have time for a couple more. Is anyone else out there? I'm going to walk around. And does anybody have a question about logistics, about how you function as a blind judge? Because we'll get to that if anyone has a question. Absolutely. OK. Hello, my yes. name is Regina. Yes. I'm a junior and I'm an international student. Okay. So that is why I'm very interested in your international experience as yes. I know that you have a pro experience. Um, could you tell a bit more about that? Yes, I'm yeah. so excited that you asked about that. So again, this goes to my core beliefs, right? There is, well, let me, let me just start with this. One of the things I'm just really proud of is in Austria, it used to be that if you were blind, you were forbidden from being a judge. They had a law that actually said that if you were blind, here are the jobs that you are not allowed to participate in. They had a law. That was a law. I am very proud to say that after working in Austria on this issue, that law is no longer there. And what's extraordinary about it is that when people come up to you, I remember having a chance to visit with a wonderful blind gentleman. He came to me and he said, Judge, he said, I had always dreamed of being a judge, but it was illegal. I can't believe that now I can do it. That's what we, as Americans, we, yes, we've got our challenge, and yes, we've got our difficulties, and yes, you know, we've got our divisions. But we are leaders in so many ways, and people really look to us. I've had the opportunity to do work in incredible places. And I'm going to ask you, this is the one thing that people are always interested in. What do you think is the one commonality that leaders across the globe have? You'll never guess it. Does anybody want to try? No matter how powerful the person is, what do you think the one commonality that they all have is? Shout it out. Shout it out if you can guess. No one ever gets it because this is why the work that we do is so complicated, is so uh, intense. Public speaking. Okay. <laughs> Fair enough. The one commonality they have, that many of them have, is they have children with severe disabilities. But in most parts of the world, it's considered to be a tremendous weakness and it's seen as a vulnerability. And when you're dealing with certain governments, especially monarchies, it's seen as destabilizing because if people realize that the descendant has a disability, that can be problematic in terms of transition. So it's kept very quiet, very confidential, and never really discussed. But they all have kids. They all have children. And when it's your baby, there's really nothing else that's more important to you. The work that I do is I don't really do policy. That's way above my head, way above my pay grade. But what do I do? I travel to different places all across the globe. In many situations, it's done very quietly for obvious reasons. What I do is I spend time with different families, I spend time with different people. And you allow for them to see what is possible allow for them to see that their children have value, that their children have purpose, that their children have a place. And when they see that in their children, they start transforming their own countries. They start creating schools for disabled children. They start creating job placement opportunities for their children. They start creating accessible technology. They start creating transit. They start making real changes that literally can change people's entire lives. And I was blessed to have the opportunity to be a keynote speaker at the United Nations, where I had a chance to speak about this. And the reaction of so many world leaders was literally something of disbelief. <coughs> because it's so foreign to how they see things and to what they think is possible. I'll tell you two very quick stories, and then we'll dive to our next question. 
But one of the places that I had a chance to spend some time, and a lot of this unfortunately got interrupted because of COVID, but I was asked to go to China. And China was a very unique experience because it's always a balancing test, right? When you go to a place like China, how do you do it, right? You're, you, they got civil rights issues, they've got all kinds of issues that they're doing. But if you're gonna go there, you, you, you have to sometimes say, look, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this because I'm gonna focus on one area, and that's helping people with disabilities. Now, if you travel the countryside of China, it is not uncommon if a child has a disability for that child to be less in trash containers. It's not uncommon throughout the countryside of China, I hope I'm not getting too graphic, but I'm just explaining to you what goes on and why this work matters. But it's not uncommon if you travel the countryside of China to see fetuses in trash cans because of the fact that the idea is that if a child has a disability, they don't really merit a place. There's a billion three people, and if a child has a disability, well, it's, the idea would be that it's best to not really have that child in the world. They don't have a purpose, they don't have a value, they don't have a reason, why have them in the first place? Right, what's their point? Here's what happens. Someone like me goes there. I become, in many situations, a vehicle for people that are in positions of tremendous power but don't want to acknowledge that their child has disability. But they desperately want to make things better, but they can't do it. So it's my job to go there and share why life matters, why this matters. Why, if you have a disabled child, they are valued. They have a benefit. They have a place and a purpose. And I'll just share with you two very quick things. Was when I was in China, I mean, they wanted to do a lot of different things in China. Um, and of course, COVID, that's changed. But I think we'll get back to it relatively soon. But usually when you go and you're giving speeches, it's very restricted. They give you 20 minutes. That way they can monitor what you're doing and what you're saying. And if you say something they don't like, they can pull the plug. What was happening when I was there was this was on the front page of all the papers. Like people in China were reading about this. I was doing events where you had thousands of people. There was one event I remember in particular where I said to the organizer, we were asking, we were taking questions and I said to the organizer, I said, you know, you said this was 20 minutes. We've gone for four hours. I said, I'm done. Like, this is insane. And they said to me, you're not done until we tell you you're done. Because the mo well, in a fun way, they said it. <laughs> I, didn't mean it I didn't mean it negatively. They said, because the minders are giving you a green light. They said, we're giving, they're giving you a green light. They said, please, they don't do this. You're getting a green light. They said, the minders are just greenlighting you on everything. And what you have to understand, when the press is covering it, the press is the government. They're greenlighting it. They were running everything that I was saying on the Chinese internet. Not, you know, this was a big deal, right? It wasn't being censored. It was actually just running, like, simulcast on the Chinese internet. And the government was, like, sending this everywhere. Because they wanted, and they were talking about how this American is allowing for us to see things in a way that we never thought possible, and that we can learn from this American. So here's what the perspective was. The, we'll never know for sure, but the working hypothesis is, and, and again, we'll never know for sure, but there's a hypothesis that's out there that was the idea that there was some very key people that were pushing this to make this a success. We'll never know who they are. But you know who the hypothesis is? You know who they think it was? They think it was the first lady of China that was behind this. But we'll never know for sure. We will never be acknowledged. We'll never be known. But that's the working hypothesis. So the idea is that you never know who 
who is listening. You never know who you're reaching, and you never know what can happen. I'll share with you one last thing. I'm very passionate about this. In Italy, there was a situation where there's a government called Five Star. Five Star government was a very kind of kind of intense group of folks, and they had made a statement that basically we don't want this. But one of the top officials in Italy basically said, Italy would be a far better country if we could rid ourselves of all these disabled people. And now that's a concern because with the history like that, you want to watch out for that. So I got called in to kind of challenge the five-star government. So I flew in, and they said, look, we need you here right away. We're gonna, it was super well organized. The idea was to challenge the government in a way that you know could be done in a very positive manner, right? I didn't go and just challenge the five-star government. I just went and told my story, explained who I was, what America gave me the opportunity to do, all the different things. And then the Italian newspapers wrote all these stories, and they started writing things like, "This has allowed for us to see and remember what it means to be Italian, that we're kind, that we're good, that we're caring. This is who we are." What was amazing was, not only did the five-star government stop talking negatively towards people with disabilities, they increased funding for all programs and services that helped people with disabilities. That's why this stuff matters. And if you do it in the right way, you never know <coughs> the kind of change or impact you'll see. What I just love this stuff. And in, in India, I was in India, and in India, this was a very intense situation. In India, they have people that are called the untouchables. And the untouchables are people that no one wants to go near because they have disabilities. And, and what I have to do whenever I go to these different places is, and the beautiful thing you know, about my job is, you know, we get February off and we get August off. So I have to be honest, I'm not a golfer, I don't go on vacation. You know, if you're gonna get February off for recess, if you're gonna get August off for recess, you should do something with it, right? You should do something with it. If they're gonna give you February off and they're gonna give you August off, well, come on. You don't, just, you don't just go on vacation, you do something. At the opportunity to go and change the world, who doesn't wanna love that chance to literally go and use that time to change the world? But I'll tell you, in India was the toughest. Because in India, what happens in many situations with the untouchables is Nobody wants these children. So they live basically in trash heaps. And when I say trash heaps, not near the trash, they actually live in the trash. What happens is many of them wind up just getting sold into prostitution and just horrible, horrible things. So I was there working with the Indian press. And we were, did any of you see the movie Slumdog Millionaire? So I was in that area of Mamba. And basically we'd go and, and the conditions were just unbelievable. But she would go, and the key was that she wanted to embrace, like, a lot of these children they had, I mean, they had, like, leprosy, they had meningitis, they had tuberculosis. Sometimes when you have faith, you might do something that might people, some people might consider, you know, a little dangerous, but you just do it, right? Because you're doing it for the right reason. That's why, you know, with COVID, I wasn't overly concerned because, you know, I had been exposed to literally leprosy, tuberculosis, meningitis, certain parts of plague that I didn't know even existed anymore, but these children were very sick and they had these conditions. But in order to show that these were people and souls of value, you had to embrace them. You couldn't be at a distance. If you're at a distance, then no one's gonna come close to them. So I really took it upon myself, you have to be very close to them. And you have to embrace them, you have to hug them. And you have to just not mind the fact they have leprosy. And you just have to accept that that's what it is, and you have to believe that, okay, you know what? You're doing something meaningful. You're doing it for the right reasons. God's going to give you a certain, if, if this is what God wants, he's going to allow for you to do this in a manner that's, that's safe and, and appropriate. And we, well, unfortunately, COVID came four days after I got home. They shut everything down. But this was incredible. The government really got behind this, and they were, trying to create models of how we could make real change. Now look, it's a billion three people, 
But the fact that this was now being discussed in ways that had not been discussed, because it used to be believed under, you have to learn all the different religions when you go to these different places, but under Hinduism, you have to, you have to understand that in many cultures, not just Hindu, but all different kinds of cultures, the belief is in many situations in a lot of these different countries that a person merits their disability. That ultimately, if, if you're disabled, it's because you merited it because of conduct of your family or of you in a past life. So you are marrying the disability that you've been given. So you have to break that perspective. Because not only do people not have empathy, but people in many situations penalize you for the disability because they think that you have an evil spirit. So you gotta really work through all that and, and, and show by understanding and appreciating the religious teachings of where you're at, you have to work within those confines to really make this work to really showcase a different perspective. And it was working. And now that I think we're done with COVID, we can all move on and start getting back into the world and do these kind of things. And I'm just gonna end with one kind of last thing. I know we're kind of out of time. But I wanna end this, because this is what I do whenever I travel and go places. So you have to show people how you do your own job so they can see why hiring a disabled person makes sense and why it matters and why it's relevant. And so in this situation, people wonder, so how do you do your job as a judge? How does it all work? If you can't see, how do you perform your duties as a judge? How does that, how does that even remotely work, right? So what happens is, is, is that every Wednesday, we have something called conference. Conference is where there are 25 cases on the conference agenda. And remember, the stakes could not be higher. You're dealing with people, this is their entire life. You're dealing with people who are facing life in prison. You're dealing with key environmental issues. You're dealing with taxation over billions of dollars. You gotta get it right. No one cares if you're blind. You gotta get this right. I asked for this. So as a result, I gotta perform. And so how does it work? Every Wednesday, there are 25 cases on the conference agenda. Every Wednesday, 25 cases. So people say, okay, do you put those cases into Braille? Well, the answer is you cannot put those cases into Braille. Because if I give you one textbook page, you're gonna give me 65 Braille pages. So a three-week murder transcript is not possible. Then people say, okay, do you use a computer? Well, you can't use a computer. Because if I'm on my headset, I'm not able to communicate with my colleagues. And if I can't communicate with my colleagues, well, what's the point of being there? How does it work? What I do is I memorize all 25 cases every week. Now, I can't learn those cases word for word because that's literally impossible. So you can't, I mean, you can't do things word for word. It's just not possible. But I can learn every key legal aspect of that case. I can tell you all the key legal issues that are being discussed. And what happens is, the commissioner will say, justices, we are now on case 18. Case 18 is a carjacking on Woodward that resulted in two murders. Now I hear carjacking resulting in two homicides. I can recall the case in its entirety. Because I have prepped with my clerks for hours and hours and hours. We don't sleep and we constantly work and we never <laughs> take a break. But here's the thing. Not only do you have to know the case that you are deciding, but you have to know all the common law cases that are on point. So there are going to be common law cases that work for you, that help your position, and there are going to be common law cases that work against your position. You have to be able to make an argument using all the cases that work for you, and then you have to distinguish all the cases that work against you. Why do we do this? Why do you do it? It's hard, it's challenging, it's exhausting, it's intensive, but it's the same thing that every student that's here today. You do it because you know that you're part of something bigger than yourself. You 
do it because you're part of something grander. You do it because it gives your life meaning. And I can tell you all the struggles and challenges, and I know so many of you have, you might not see it now. Those of you who are having the greatest difficulties are going to have the most powerful impact. You are going to do things that are going to make life better for countless numbers of people. And it might not be easy. And it might be challenging. And it might be daunting. I'm going to make you one promise. It's going to be incredibly fulfilling. Thank you so much for coming. I'm going to stay around if people want to talk offline and they have personal questions. <laughs>